amount of advice from agents and studio people, but maybe we can hear something about that. I think it's a, a terrific move that Steve made, and I'm very, very pleased that we've been able to get the film down here and that Steve has come down to, to chat about it. And uh, we achieved, and they said we couldn't do it and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing about the casting, I thought the girl who played Petra was particularly interesting. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. She's she a New York stage actor? actor? Yes. Yeah. Everybody. You know, they were all, all New York people, all very, very learned people about their craft. And I tell you, I, I studied that script because I'm, I don't have a very good mind for memorizing. And I'll tell you, you don't want, ever want to get out of step with those actors because <laughs> you're dead. You know. That's terrific. Um, well, now, what about the? Uh, the distribution plan is that is that still open or what's going to happen well i had a great deal of opposition doing the film and and they didn't want me to do it and i can understand why i'm not sure the film will make any money in its present form i i'd be very surprised if it does i, I don't know that people will really care about that i think that audiences per se at least i used to uh, that if a man works very very hard and he comes home he wants to watch Archie Bunker. I know I do. If I work hard, I want to escape, escapism. If people do like the film, uh, then I think we should present a good surroundings for the audience. I feel that it should go one to maybe two theaters in the United States, possibly three, and I think that it's a very intimate film and it should be a 400-seat house. The problem that we have is because of the 29-millimeter lens, I know when, when we first it started running it, and, and, and for editing purposes, I kept asking the projections to rack over and rack over because I, we kept getting fuzzy. And what it was, it's so terribly critical that it's got to be a small house. The sound has got to be just right because, I mean, we made mistakes, but we slaved over this. And if you have a film that's slow, then you, you must treat it, I think, with great respect for the audience and create an atmosphere where they'll be able to listen and to enjoy. And I believe that would say a, 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 a 400 seat house, yes. Mm -hmm. Three theaters, and I would, uh, to, to carry on though, but to go on to, 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 to different colleges in the United States, I would like to take the film and see if I can get some education. Uh, you know, because it, I was standing outside and I you know, get nervous and I walk away, you know, because you guys are hard audiences no matter what. And yet, it was hot in here and it was stuffy and people were laughing and you know enjoying this thing and this is for me is an experience so i would like to take it and see what happens with it and keep it away from the public temporarily i think I'm, <laughs> i think i'm scared to show it to <laughs> you're a captivated audience you can't leave <laughs> that's great okay well let's let's get some questions from from the floor so who wants to begin over here uh, well, since this film was made uh, because you wanted to be made for yourself, that you I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, you, uh, you made this film and you want, you made it so that because you wanted to make it right. But what kind of response? Let's say it's a good response. Are you looking for? Let's say it's presented in temporary cities or whatever, say Los Angeles or San Francisco or whatever. What kind of response are you looking for from the people? I mean. I I, I don't I don't know that I I really don't I don't know who our audience is. That's the thing. We've we've it's been we snuck at three separate places, and uh, I've been asked to stay away because I caused such a commotion with the projection and all. But we really don't know who our audience is. Strangely enough, we ran it in Indianapolis with uh, the James Bond film, <laughs> right next to it, and you know that's suicide. It really is. They loved it. You know, I, they wouldn't allow me to come near it. You know, the studio just said, stay away. But uh, from what I understand, it was it, it was received very well. I don't know what I want from an audience. I would like, perhaps, for them to see what I see as a filmmaker. That's what I would like. Maybe that's the answer. I, I'm, I don't know. I, I would like somebody, you know, to perk up and see some of the things that Ibsen wrote. And uh, I feel like a cherry in the sense that I haven't been with Ibsen that long. But what I do, what I have learned from him is very, very good. Okay. Yes, Donna. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying that I felt the treatment of the stage play, of Ibsen's play, done on film was excellent. I've seen a lot of theater done on film, and it just doesn't come off well. But the timing seemed to be good, and the lighting and the music really worked well. 
to make a stage story a film story. Thank you. But what I'd really like to know is how was the conflict between you as executive producer and actor? How did you work out those roles and what were the conflicts and what were the compromises that you had to make in those two roles? You, uh, wearing the two hats? Right. Okay. Uh, I'm used to it because I've had the training for it. I've been producing films for years, but I've never wanted to take screen credit because I didn't really need it. I thought it'd be better to buy another head who was smarter than I was. Now you need to do it in order to be able to handle the film through exhibitors. Uh, I don't have that problem. It gets tiring and I have to take care of myself physically, but it, 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 I was in charge. If there was any mistakes, I pay for them. So I had no opposition, and I'm not a compromiser. So I found myself constantly pushing and pushing and pushing, and was getting great support from my my coworkers. The only people that gave me difficulty were the money, the buck people, and you can't blame them. They want to see me crash and bang and sh But I think if your question of how to sell it is the name of the game, and we don't know yet, and I hope we find a way. <laughs> We're not going to take tomorrow. Go ahead. Now, the way Hester Street grew popular uh, in new theaters like that. I love that film. Hester Street? Yeah. It was wonderful. It, it well, it, it caught on. It caught on. We don't know whether this will or not. This may just go flash by or people might become interested in. You never know until, until they pay their hard dollars to walk in and see it. Yes. Um, I just like to say that I was in San Francisco this weekend, and I thought any minute you were going to come ripping around the corner. Then I get home and I wanted to relax, and what was on TV, The Getaway. Then I walk into this class, and they say, "See the movie, see the movie." You know, the minute you walked on the screen, it was it was really impressive. And I'm not trying to say anything bad about the image I had about you because it was totally different, and and both are good. And I think what you've done, you made a joke about Butte, Montana, but you've made it's impalpable to somebody in Butte, Montana. I'm an ignorant ex-English major, and I sat here, and I liked it, and I, I felt I was doing something cultural for myself, and I think, <laughs> I think that you've really done a good job, and I, I, I'm sorry that you asked so many questions about how you think it's going to work, because I think you should have a little faith in you on him. <laughs> Well done. Thank you, Stuart yeah. McQueen. I'll remember that. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Blue shirt. Yeah, you say you were uh, skeptical from the beginning to some degree about the viability of this project as a profit maker. Whoa. <laughs> just, just start again. I'm sorry, I didn't get all the words. You, you said you were a little bit doubtful regarding uh, uh, this this film's potential as a, as a profit maker. Right. I wonder how you approach the money people with the project that you yourself are fully confident in. Do you have to kind of give them a snow job? No. No, no. I was under contract. I had three pictures to do for first artist. I, ha I have no salary up front and a percentage of the action. And. Uh, uh, I had uh, $3 million to work with, and uh, I had to put it on the screen. And the thing was, the reason I'm not getting paid is because I have control of what I want to do. Although once I popped the button, it was getting great, great bad reactions. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, no, I don't think it'll make a lot of money, but uh, it might. I don't know. It breaks even. At low, it, if, it, if it's three, we, went, we brought it in for two five. And it'll break even at two times under negative, probably come in a little under six, and maybe six two at the most. So it'll probably see some bucks, but that wasn't the reason, you know. I had my choice of doing what I wanted to do, and that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't have any opposition from anybody as far as anybody having to snow people because it's not going to make bucks. See, as I understand it, First Artist was designed really to let actors do the things that they wanted to do. It's kind of a cooperative involving yourself and I think Poitier and Mark uh, Streisand and Dusty Hoffman. Right. Yeah. And uh, as I said, okay. the idea is not to take money up front, but to, to be able to do a project and then participate in the rewards if, if there are some. And uh, you hope there will be some. Anyway, uh, yes, in the back. Yes. Um, 
Have you ever thought about giving up drafting and going into producing? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm thinking on it. I really am. I'd like to quit at the top, and I'd like to make contributions as a producer, and maybe direct. And uh, then if something came for a good old character part, I'd be all ready. <laughs> Yes, Fred. Speaking as producer, what do you think are the strongest and weakest points of this film? The, the, the strongest and the weakest? <laughs> nice. I'll make notes. <laughs> that would have been okay. Uh, the weakest points, I think, probably. I, I, I'm not objective about my performance, so that we got to leave whatever, whatever. I think because of the purity and the nature of it, it's dull. And so, in the first beginning, the first 20 minutes are very slow and very dull, okay? Uh, I think that we shot the interiors in five interiors. There's no exteriors there. That's all interior, okay? I think that works against you. It's closed in. I think that people basically will, if they're heady, they'll go with it. If there's an escape mechanism, I don't think they'll, they'll, they'll want to get to it. On the strong side of it, I think they're wonderful, wonderful performances from these actors in this play. I think the technique in this film, the lighting, the camera, and all of that, in our craft, and I worked my buns off for about a month and a half in a little cement room, is that in our craft, people are gonna like it because there ain't no bullshit, there was no compromise, we got it done. That's gonna work for it, and also I think what it says because of Mr. Ibsen is gonna work for us because no matter what, you'll all go out of here and go to bed or go have a beer, or take your lady or whatever, but you'll think about this a little while, what was said there. And I think all of us will. That's why I did it. So therefore, if they catch on to what's said there and, and it does something to them, that's a good point. I don't know about bucks, but it's a good point for our team. Yes, back there. Yeah, you said, uh, Earl, you said earlier that you had done some production even though you hadn't gotten screen credit for it, yeah. but that this was the first thing you had done that you were really proud of for yourself. Should you not act any more in the near future, but go more strongly into production, would you be working in films of this type or more of the entertainment films? Okay, you asked me four questions and I'll, I'll try and answer them. Um, I started getting educated in production when I first did a film called The Blob. That's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, from there, I went into television to do Wanted Dead or Alive for three years, which I enjoyed very much. It was a half-hour show, and uh, took three days to shoot it, two days out, one day in, and I did 120-some shows. That gave me preparation for production. And I, I do love production, but I don't like the bullshit that goes with it. It really, the pecking order in anything we do in society today is spooky, because you constantly have to play the game, and there's no different in our business. Out of that, I, I, I ended up being lucky enough to get better parts, make better money, more sophisticated productions. And I learned my craft being exposed. Now, I never was interested in producing on screen. I have an ego. I mean, I'd love to see Steve McQueen produce by. But I thought it was bad for my audience because I think people would like just to see me act and they're not interested in whether I'm involved in producing or not. And I wasn't secure enough about my own conceptions and there was many things I did that I was proud of I could have put my name on, but I wanted to get someone that knew more than I do uh, than I did so I could get educated by him. So by paying his salary, I could learn from him, which I did. And this is not the only thing I'm proud of I thought I put my name on. I did it because now the movies have changed. It's not a game anymore. It's big bucks, heavy bucks. And those people play for keeps out there. And they have a way, you know, there's a lot of way a man can be hurt or a woman in business. They can hurt your head, they can hurt you financially, but they can gut you. You know, they can cause that thing to pop up in your throat a couple of times a day. You start thinking about it a little bit. If I have my name on there, they can no longer palm me off as uh, just a candy-ass movie star who they've got to be easy with, even though I've used it for refuge sometimes when things got heavy and hot. This puts me out front as, a, as an executive, so therefore they have to deal with me. In the exhibiting, uh, uh, in the exhibiting distributing market, and then the last one, I don't remember what the other last part. What kind of one. movies that you get involved with now? I I don't know. I really honestly don't know. I'm sure tired of shooting them up, 
And, I, and I'm not saying, you know, I've been a whore in my life, and I'm not, I don't think I'll be one again real soon, though. Uh, but I have been, and I'm not saying I wouldn't do a movie, you know, and so forth, that has to do with just escapism, but it would have to be good. I would love to do something that's meaningful, you know? Really mean, and it's hard to find it. I mean, in my age caliber, and I'm not 26 anymore, so if the young thing comes along, it ain't gonna be for me. I've gotta go the other direction. And that leaves me to the, you know, the guy with, uh, like this, and that's not too good. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm starting to feel a little silly about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, the girl on the stripe. Oh, okay. yeah. I was just wondering, um, how long did it take to produce this? Like, did it take six months, a year? To produce it? Yeah. Or, no, well, it usually, uh, well, this film, I would say closer to seven and a half months. But that doesn't, not the execution, you know. I mean, this film was shot in nine weeks, but uh, almost nine weeks. But it was what went on before and what went on afterwards. It's like Thalberg said, you know, many movies are made in the editing room. We did, no, we did some retakes, two retakes on me because I was just awful, you know, and they had to go in and do a retake. And I couldn't remember my line. And then we uh, went back and fooled a lot with the sound. We spent a lot of time with sound, getting the gauge. Because a lot of times, you know, audiences will sit in a film and not know there's something wrong, but they won't like it. And I, I'm, and I, I can't tell you what it would be, but I, I know that if you get the sound perfect, and you get your sight value perfect, then if it goes down, you've shot your best shot and you can't compromise. So uh, in that sense, we had to make sure everything was right. And that took a lot longer than it would normally, but we didn't have a, a big carry-all. We didn't have a big force to carry. Once the film was completed, I had a very little payroll to handle so I could stretch it and take the time to work on it. Right. Stop. Yes, it's easy for us obligation to your audiences in terms of the themes that you might portray as a producer. Um, that obligation, I guess, has obviously evolved or changed given your career. Where does it stand today? What types of obligations do you feel towards your audiences? My audience? I've always felt a very strong responsibility towards my audience. I've never gypped them in my life, and I never will. And I feel that very, very strongly. But my obligation has got to be to myself. In other words, I'm not late to work. I never cheat them. And I, if I, if, if, I always felt the things that I did before when I was in the physical area. If I took a chance, I really took it, you know? And not be, for any other reason except that I think it's, it looks foul if you don't. But you've got to believe in what you're doing, like you believe in what you do. I believe in what I do. And if I'm shooting my best shot for me, that's, then, then, I'm, then I'm doing my, my best for the audience. If I try to figure out what they want and get devious and so forth, then I'm not doing good for them or me, if that's answering it in any way. Yes, in the back. You know, I've always uh, liked the film The Reavers that you were in. I was wondering how you got into that project. I was railroaded. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I sang in that picture, too. <laughs> uh, well, I think because the man who wrote it, uh, Faulkner, you know, it was really a jar for me, and I love what they had to say. You know, I love the black and white scene there, you know, and I love the, I love the feeling of our country then. You know, I, I could see it on film, and I love the whole feeling of it, and, and I love doing it. I really enjoyed that. It's coming back on television the week of September 18th. <laughs> it's, it's around the 20th or the 21st, sometime like that. I was just writing about it today. So yes, uh, wait a minute, somebody, somebody hasn't asked before. Yes, back there, are the glasses on, I think. Yeah. Um, in the town meeting, when Hofstad uh, announced you, he was definitely a Judas figure, especially with the black beard. You were a Christ figure with the, you didn't look like it. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about being, about that, being a Christ figure? I didn't look at it that way, but one thing about film that I think is so constructive, and that is like reading, I, it allows you to make up your mind as you see it. And that's really what it is. Uh, you're right about him. He became the heavy, in a sense. But did he really? Uh, you know, and for me, being the Christ figure, I, I, people have mentioned that before. I didn't, that never occurred to me. I think film, people will make things out of film that aren't even there. 
And I think that's one of the wonderful things. I don't mean that as a slam, but you know, but I mean, this is your, this is what you see. And other people will see different things and the same thing. And other people have seen what you see, but it was not my intention. I'll tell you why I looked the way I looked was because I fashioned my character after the first gentleman that I saw a photograph of that did the play on, this, on stage in New York, no, no, in, uh, in Norway in 1902. And I copied his wardrobe and the way he looked because Dr. Stoppen was a bit mad. And the thing, you know, he wasn't right either. I mean, he, he was busy, you know, pushing buttons and, and he handled everything wrong, although what he was trying to do is right. What I saw in the film was everyone turning against him one at a time. His friends, his best friends, his wife. And his daughter was the only one that really kind of looked at it with any clear picture of, 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 of perhaps his survival. His children turned against him in the end. And that's what I think that the element of truth was all about there. It's, it, it has to do with the common man. And the, and the common truth about the common man we've lost in our society. Everything is so complex now that nobody even talks in a first dimension. We all talk in a third dimension. And, and, and if I, in places I do business, nobody comes up and just asks me what they want. They, it gets so flowery. And, and, and I feel that there's a, a, a very strong parallel between who founded this country, these guys who didn't compromise. When they shook your hand, they looked you in the eye and they kept their word. And if they said they were going to do something, they came damn close to doing it. I think Ibsen was saying the same thing, even though I know he was hurt by the, when they knocked the hell out of his first play. Excuse me, man. And I, I think that's what, you know, but the way he handled the press at the time. And I think we're into a lot of yellow journalism at this time and what's going on. I watched Nixon, I watched Nixon on television, and one of the things that he did say is that the, that the media has gotten so powerful and movies are part of that interpretation. And uh, I'm, not, I'm 47 years old, and believe me, I don't know my ass. But I do know this, that, that I see difference in our society over the years that I've spent wheeling and dealing and staying alive. In our, in our, that it's changed. People aren't straight. Very rarely are they straight in business anymore. And you see the people who are starting to get straight are really starting to come out and shine. It's going to be up to you. <laughs> Okay. Yes, in the blue. Yes, this film obviously created a challenge for you, Steve McQueen, the actor, to me. I'm curious to know what kind of goals you uh, were hoping to uh, get out of the film. I was only frightened of being very bad. That's the first thing. I just didn't want to be embarrassing. And I wanted to do it because of uh, what I just said before. But I, I, had, uh, I just wanted something to be done that I felt was pure and that had to do with somebody who wrote something that I really, really believed in, and it was a classic, and I'm an actor, and that's a responsibility towards my craft, to, all, to do one classic, and I've done that. Uh, let's see, yes, over here. Where did you get the two boys in that film? I'm sorry? The two boys? The two boys? We cast them, and uh, George had used the older boy, the younger boy. <laughs> He's funny. He was the one that did the wonderful thing with the bear up in Canada. I've forgotten the name of it. Was it Grizzly Adams? He was a little boy than that, and I tell you, that kid was really something. Whew. He, he's wonderful and a very creative kid, but you'd have to pull him down off the, off the ropes. And, you know. We'll there take we. about, I think, maybe two more questions, Steve. Is that okay with you? Uh, I, whatever. All right. Let's see. Going back to the problem of advertising, I, you know, I see a whole new light what you're thinking about this kind of, um, it's a more mature attitude. A what? This more mature, not mature, but you know, ideal of acting where you want to display something more than just exhibition. But how are you going to relate that to the audience? You know, to say, I mean, like, people are going to look in the paper, they're going to see Stephen Queen and an enemy of the people. Mm -hmm. Most I'm sure people haven't heard of it, so like, you know, I have. And, you know, people are going to go the ideal that they're going to go see it and then they see Stephen Queen kill a bunch of people or, you know, come out the hero. And I can't help thinking, just from my opinion, that if I came to a movie with that attitude, I walk away kind of disgusted and disappointed that I didn't see Stephen Queen that way. And how do you plan to, you know, get to the people's ideal of what the movie they may see? People are, that's a very... Spending a lot of time wondering about how they're going to advertise. That's a very intelligent question, and this is exactly what I'm 
fighting with right now? And I don't know the answer because I don't know who my audience is. I honestly don't. Uh, I think there's a big danger with the audience of going in and getting angry. Uh, I, at first I thought, well, could we educate people in the United States about Ibsen? I wanted to use an Ibsen logo, you know, Henrik Ibsen. And, and that didn't work. And the studios are as confused as I am, and they don't know what to do either. So we don't know what the answer is. And we, we were sneaking it, trying to...